DeMatha felt very honored when our speaker today accepted our invitation to address the class of 2013 and their families. His list of achievements and academic credentials is significant. He graduated magnum cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania in 2007 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy, political science, and economics. He went on to earn a Master's of Science degree with distinction from Oxford University in England in comparative social policy. He was in residence as a doctoral research student at Yale University, and while on full scholarship, he earned his Doctorate of Philosophy degree in social policy and social work from Oxford in 2012. He is currently an adjunct faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania after completing years as a lecturer at Oxford University, a freelance writer for the New York Times, a coordinator of a faith-based youth leadership and basketball program in Philadelphia, as well as serving two years as a White House intern in the Office of Strategic Initiatives. This is quite a resume already, but we save the best credential for last. Our distinguished speaker, with all these academic credentials and work experiences, is first and foremost a member of the DeMatha class of 2003. He was a three-year member of the Valois chapter of the National Honor Society. He was the sophomore representative for the student government. He is a four-year letter winner for DeMatha varsity basketball. He sat in the same classrooms as you did. He learned from the many of the same faculty members as teachers and mentors as you have. He participated in the Christian service hours and we believe he is using many of his DeMatha experiences in guiding his research in urban studies in post-Katrina New Orleans. Our speaker knew what it meant to be a gentleman and a scholar. And on graduation day in 2003, in this beautiful Basilica of the National Shrine, he received the graduation award as the Army Scholar Athlete as well as the Matha Faculty Award for General Excellence and the Maryland Distinguished Scholar Award. While in college, he continued participating in athletics for all four years and was named two-time academic All-Ivy. And in his senior college year, he started every game. He played 115 college basketball games, had 219 assists, caused 176 turnovers, blocked 86 shots, and forced 79 steals. It is an honor to welcome back to DeMatha, the salutatorian of the DeMatha class of 2003, Dr. Stephen Danley. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Father. It's only after you leave DeMatha that you can fully appreciate the comfort of Father Damien's voice. So, thanks for having me back. I want to give a big congratulations first to the class of 2013, so if we can give it up for the class. I want to give an even bigger congratulations to your parents. You made it. Um, it was just 10 years ago that I stood at this same podium and graduated from DeMatha. And it struck me as I sat down to write the speech today that a lot has changed. When I started at DeMatha, John Moylan was principal, Morgan Wooten was head basketball coach, and the late great Buck Offit was still roaming the halls as a teacher. I played under Mike Jones when he was the interim head basketball coach, was a teammate of Elijah Brooks as he played varsity basketball with me, and was a classmate of Andrew Bright. Uh, but I sat down and I realized I had a lot of people to thank and a lot of people who stuck around. Great teachers like Rich Macheski and Mary Yarish, Tom Burke and Tom Krasowitz. And I realized if I stood up here and, and thanked everyone who meant something to me and stayed, that could be the entire speech. 
Um, so I stopped by DeMatha yesterday, I stopped by this morning, and I just tried to make the rounds. You'll come to appreciate your teachers and how they stay and what it means to be able to come back later. One person I would be remiss if I didn't thank is a personal hero of mine, Dr. McMahon. To this day, I have three recurring dreams. The first is that I'm a DeMatha freshman again, and after a holiday weekend, I walk in on a Tuesday, except I've walked into the wrong class because of a rotating schedule. The second dream is that it's a fourth visit to the NCAA tournament after three losses, except I show up to the stadium and I've forgotten my shoes. And the third dream is that I come back as an adult to take Dr. McMahon's class. Um, that's a dream I plan on making happen. I'm sure DeMatha thought I'd tell stories like that, stories about dreams like that when they invited me to come speak. Um, but I actually want to tell stories about those first two dreams and talk about what it means to be embarrassed, what it means to be powerless, and what it means to feel like things aren't going right. And the thing I want you to remember at those times is you have more power than you think you do. And I see a couple of parents cringing in the back. And I'm sure what you're thinking is the last thing we need to tell a bunch of 17 and 18 year old seniors is that they have power. But I think the thing is that next year none of you will be seniors. You'll be freshmen. And for some of you that's a literal description. Some of you will be off to University of Maryland or Salisbury or Williams College. For some of you that's a metaphor. You'll start jobs. For some of you you'll be serving in the military. No matter what it's going to be hard. And I know what you're thinking. You're young, you're male, and you think that makes you invincible. It doesn't. I learned this the hard way. I showed up to the University of Pennsylvania a basketball recruit. My first day, I ripped down a rebound and let out a scream. And as I turned to go up the court, a senior punched me, pulled me in close, and he said, remember, you're just a freshman around here. So I did what any DeMatha student would do. I got right back in his face. And I said, remember, you are a gentleman and a scholar. I got my first summer job at a prestigious law firm in Georgetown. I was very excited to become a corporate lawyer, and I showed up the first day in my only suit and a bright yellow tie that someone told me was a power tie. And uh, my boss looked at me and he laughed, not because of the tie. He sent me home and he said, go put on jeans and a t-shirt. We hired you to paint the walls of the law firm this summer. <laughs> I said, I thought I was going to be assistant law clerk. He says, that's what we call it so you can put it on your resume and it looks good. <laughs> Look, this is, going to be happen this is going to happen to you. Um, you're going to walk in and find out that your boss has a rule that says you can't leave until he leaves the office. You're going to be sitting there 9 o'clock every day going through your Twitter feed and trying to stream Nats games on your phone. That happened to me at the White House. Um, but the question I want to ask um, you today and I want to talk about is, what do you do when you feel like you're powerless? The Oxford Dictionary defines power as the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. To math, of course, we have our own definition of power. We define it in terms of first place finishes in band or chorus competitions, in terms of championship jackets and championship sports victories. And when I was here, we defined it in terms of a, a running tally to see how many times we could get Mr. Davies to ask us to tuck in our shirt or wear a belt. Um, we think we know what power is, and it doesn't have anything to do with weakness. We think power is authority, Power is decision making, power is money. It's going to be a while before you have any of those things. So what I want to talk to you about today are ways you can claim power without money or control. Dr. James Scott calls these techniques the weapons of the weak. And I spent much of my life observing, studying, and enacting them. I want you to know what they are and how they work. My favorite weapon of the week is service. This may seem counterintuitive, but service is actually extremely powerful. I first learned this on the basketball court, when my coaches would come to me and they'd ask me to mentor a younger player, to push him harder in practice and to work with him after practice. Except I found that it was when I was pushing other players that I performed my best and improved the most. Power through service. 
Over and over, I've seen the same thing off the court. When I showed up at the University of Pennsylvania, we all chuckled as the uncool students took on tasks and busy work and did extra assignments and group projects. No one was chuckling junior, senior year when those were the students who ran student organizations or got the best jobs. Power through service. And the greatest example of power through service is the one you witnessed every day at DeMatha, teaching. I learned this one the hard way. I was studying to complete my um, doctorate at Oxford. I turned in the first two chapters of my doctorate. My supervisor gave them back to me and in his British way told me, not only were they not good enough to stand as the first two chapters, but that I had to throw away six months of work and start over. Right about this time, I left Oxford and came back to the States. My supervisor told me at the time he never thought I would complete the doctorate. I got a job to make ends meet at the University of Pennsylvania teaching a class on my research. And it was there I discovered that as I was trying to explain my work to my students, that I didn't understand it as well as I thought I did. It was my students who forced me to understand and explain my own work, who gave me the words to write my own doctorate. I learned that teaching refines and creates expertise, and that power comes through service. This all surprised me, but it shouldn't have. I should have learned it in first period with Father Damien during religion class. St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12.10, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This scripture passage isn't a promise about the future. It isn't a promise about heaven. It's a promise that when we engage in service, when we volunteer, when we do extra work, that is what makes us powerful. I want to pull this all the way back to this idea of the dreams that I started with, the idea of powerlessness and weakness. And I want to talk about what it's like when you're on the other side of the coin as well. What it's like when someone walks into the wrong class and you're the one sitting there who has a choice of whether or not to laugh. What it's like when we're in control. I want to ask, what do we do with power once we have it? When we're powerful, too often we take away the dignity and decision-making of those less powerful. We coerce them. The problem with this should be intuitive to a group of young men. Imagine if your parents told you you weren't allowed to date someone, or God forbid they told you who you had to date. The irony is their parents might be right, but as human beings, we cherish the ability to make decisions for ourselves, even if it means making mistakes. Let me flip the script for a second. How many times have you been waiting for wings at Benny's and found out that a homeless man will come up to you and ask you for money? If your family is anything like my family, what you try to do sometimes is scrape together some money and buy them a meal. But is what we're doing when we buy someone a meal rather than give them the money they ask for really that different than what our parents are doing? We're assuming we know better how to use that money than they do. But how do we know they're not saving up to buy the mental health drugs that will allow them to keep a job? Or to enroll in an alternative education program that would allow them to get a job? How is saying that we will buy them food and we know better than them that different than our parents telling us they know who we should be dating? Taking decisions away from people is all the rage where I come from. I spent the last 10 years in policy communities, first as a student at Penn and Oxford, and later as a lecturer at both places. These communities are full of assumptions about the privilege that comes with money and power. At Oxford, there's a club full of princes and royalty and rich. And the only requirement to get in this club is you have to be able to go out in a given night and spend $15,000. What they do is they walk into a bar they tear the hangings off the wall, they break the wall stools, the, the bar stools, and they shatter the glasses of, or the bottles of liquor. And then they, on the way out, they leave a check for $15,000 to pay for the damages. My degree program at Oxford was chock full of Rhodes Scholars and others, including one guy who famously carved O'Shea for president 2024 into his desk. Yes, he was voting for himself for president 16 years early. He's just, one of, uh, two, he's just one of a number of people who have been elected to public office among my friends, and there's a whole bunch of them getting in line to do it next. And 
What unifies many of these future policymakers is their belief that they should make decisions for other people. This is what passes for enlightened policy these days. The solution to obesity is restricting how much soda we can buy. After the recession, we gave tremendous amounts of aid to hard luck families in the, for in the form of food stamps. But if those families needed to use aid to pay for rent, they had to go break the law and sell those food stamps. We're telling people how to make their decisions, and we're not doing it that well. A whole economic discipline, behavioral economics, rests on the idea that you can make subtle changes to influence people's behaviors, and the idea that policymakers know how to influence behaviors and what they should do. And the educational debate du jour is over the national common core of standards, an idea that will tell teachers what to teach and students what to learn. Too often my friends believe they have a right to make decisions for others. They believe that right is derived from their intelligence, but it really comes from their power. You or I would never accept someone coming up to us in the grocery store and telling us we had to buy something because they were smarter than us. And we sure wouldn't accept someone coming up to us in the grocery store and telling us we had to buy something because they had more power than us. There are going to be times when you have that power. You are the Matha graduates, after all. And I hope you think deeply and seriously about whether it is a good idea to use that power to take decisions away from other people. As you graduate and move on to the next big thing, I hope you aren't seduced by power into thinking you should make decisions for others. I hope you use your abilities to empower other people, not take their dignity and not take their decisions. If your class is anything like mine, the DeMatha community is going to be exceptionally proud of your accomplishments. So class of 2013, congratulations and best of luck. I pray you use your power wisely.